South Korea have agreed to resolve their dispute through dialogue. At the same time, the North has agreed to send a delegation to the 2018 Winter Olympic Games taking place in South Korea in February. The breakthrough announcement came as the countries met for their first high-level talks in more than two years. The delegation will include athletes, officials and a group of cheerleaders. South Korean officials say a military hotline between the nations, suspended for nearly two years, will also be reinstated from today. A North Korean delegation making strides across the world's most heavily militarized border into the south, crossing it for the first time in more than two years. Seoul and Pyongyang kicked off formal talks on Tuesday with an optimistic outlook on the upcoming Winter Olympics, set to be held just kilometers away from the border next month. North Korea has confirmed it will also send a delegation to the Games, including high-ranking officials and athletes, along with the country's famous cheering squad, which has been a huge hit in the South in their past rare appearances. Seoul has also suggested that athletes from the two Koreas march together during events, including the opening ceremony, something they've done in past sports events as a sign of unity. Despite its narrow, primarily sports-related agenda on Tuesday, all eyes around the globe are focused on the talks, which could stretch on into the week, with world leaders eager for signs tensions over the North's nuclear program is cooling off. Our talks begin after a long period of severed ties between the North and the South, but I believe the first step is half the journey. South Korea proposed talks between both militaries to start and a reunion of family members in time for February's Lunar New Year holiday. Professor John Strimlau of the Department of International Relations at Wurz University joins us via Skype to look into this matter further. Prof, thank you so much for joining us. Now, what do you make of this olive branch that the two sides appear to be exchanging? Well, I think you're right to give it attention. You know, we've had so much saber rattling between the United States and North Korea whose nuclear button is bigger than the other guy's nuclear button, that it's, it's really important that President Moon of South Korea has quietly been pursuing this for several months, and that Kim Jong-un on New Year's uh, speech uh, called for this kind of cooperation and a door opening. It's only a beginning of a very long and difficult process, these always are, but it's a very important beginning. Mm. Now, Puff, North Korea has said that uh, it would not discuss its nuclear weapons um, in coming talks and uh, uh, with Seoul because uh, these were aimed at only uh, the United States, not what it termed its brethren in South Korea. Would this not stifle talks going forward? Well, it's very, dif it's very difficult to know whether or not the United States and China uh, are working together to try to defuse this. It certainly doesn't appear that way from the irresponsible tweeting that Donald Trump uh, has been doing, and he may well indeed try to claim credit for this breakthrough, but it really is a function, I think, of the uh, long-standing efforts by different people in the Korean Peninsula to try to overcome this stalemate, which goes back 70 years. They're still in a state of war declared between the two, and yet you know that they're the same people, the same language, and yet the South Koreans are a very, very great democracy and economic success, and North Korea has an economy that's smaller than Zimbabwe, and it's probably worse run than Zimbabwe's. So it's kind of like a Zimbabwe with nuclear weapons. That's all they have. And it's really time to start a long and careful process of defusing this. And it has to be owned by the people on the peninsula. And I don't think Donald Trump's tweeting about this helps at all. Now, Prof, just uh, looking at, uh, well, just going back to what you just said, the fact that uh, um, the peninsula itself, uh, which is North Korea and South Korea, should be able to deal with these problems. The hotline that's been reinstated starting from today clearly is very key. That hotline, what is it really about? What, how, does the, how does the hotline work? Do you have details of how it works and how it operates between both countries? Well, I can only imagine from my brief experience in, in government and also in dealing with the South Koreans in policy planning talks years ago that they do need this warning to quickly 
signal if there's been a mistake or a miscalculation. It's more symbolic and reassuring. It's a confidence building measure. It really doesn't change the situation very much. We really have a problem on the Korean Peninsula that you have so much poverty and misgovernment in the north that if there was to be a reunification like we saw between uh, East and West Germany, the, the South Koreans used to tell me, and I'm sure it hasn't changed, they really don't feel they can afford the costs of trying to integrate because the, the South Korean population is, is a lot bigger than uh, the North Koreans, but, and their economy is a lot bigger, but they're about the equal size, and the poverty in the North is terrible. Mm. It, you know, the South Korean uh, per capita income is 12 times what it is in the North. And so there'd have to be a working out of a long process with help from China, with help from the United States and other friendly powers. And I think South Africa should be cheering this process on. It's just wonderful to see sports become a venue for confidence building. And that's all we have right now, but that's a good step. Now, Prof, just mentioning that sport is, as uh, the world over, sport is, is known to be a unifier. This has opened doors going forward. Now, the United States has close to um, 30,000 troops uh, who are stationed in South Korea as a legacy of uh, the 1950 to 1953 Korean War. Would North Korea make this deployment a necessary part of their dialogue um, to find a solution going forward to maybe get those um, as, you know, uh, as soldiers or troops stationed in South Korea to be moved out of that area? Well, it'll be part of the equation. Bear in mind that, and I worked for Jimmy Carter and admire him greatly, when he was president back in the uh, late 1970s, he pulled out the vast bulk of American forces. There's just one brigade left there, and it's, it's substantial, as you pointed out, but it's nowhere near the kind of military presence that there was before the Carter administration. And Jimmy Carter believes very much in dialogue and has, in fact, offered to go over and do what he did for Bill Clinton, which was to create a, a channel of communications for, for, for a kind of an accommodation with the North. It didn't work out over the longer term, but it was a good step to try, and I think they should try it again. But I think this is not a major issue. The major issue is really how do you uh, reassure the North, which is very fragile, but at the same time very tough and could be reckless, so that they don't do anything crazy. You've got two crazy men in this game. One is Donald Trump and the other is Kim Jong-un. And so I can understand why President Moon in South Korea is nervous. And I understand why Xi Jinping wants to defuse it. But it's a very, very complicated game. It's going to take a while. Prof, you mentioned the fact that it's a very complicated game and it will take a while. What are the, really the big issues between the two nations, South Korea and North Korea? Well, the obvious one is that you have a very successful South Korea uh, as a member of the OECD. It's an industrialized country. It's got a booming uh, society, and it's a great democracy. And there's nothing in the North other than nuclear weapons and poverty. They have very little to export other than guns. They are very insecure, paranoid, and they're a family dictatorship that's been going on for 70 years and longer. It's an old civilization, goes back uh, to the time of, of, of Christ, but it does not have any kind of flexibility or adaptability. And it's just going to take the South Koreans building confidence slowly, offering incentives, but being tough to try to contain any reckless action by the North. And, and, and there's just no way around that. We've known that for 70 years, but I don't mind having things move slowly as long as they don't move dangerously. Kim Jong-un, North Korea's leader, has um, long threatened to turn that, uh, to turn Asia into, um, just to quote him, into a sea of fire. Can one now say that uh, they have reached that capability with uh, their weapons? They've always had this capability relative to the population in the South. You know, uh, Seoul, Korea is only 25 miles from the DMZ, and the South and the North could explode that.
Peninsula, Peninsula the South has every reason to try to, to, to contain the problem. The North has nothing other than its own suicide. Why would it want to commit suicide? But it doesn't really have anything to bargain with beyond the nuclear threat. That's the problem. And the Chinese have been willing to sort of let the status quo drift on, the United States as well, whereas Kim Jong-un has escalated with his increased nuclear capacity. But when the right wing in the U.S. talks now about doing preemptive uh, military strikes against the North Korean uh, military installation, they may think that that uh, intimidates the North I'm more skeptical. I know Donald Trump may think that his sable rattling has brought us to this point, but I think it's the economic desperation of the North, the isolation of the North, the pressure from the Chinese, and then the openness by the South Korean government to be able to gauge and, and start this Peace Olympics as at least another effort to try to see whether or not you can find a formula that will be sufficiently reassuring to the North to allow for a transition process to begin. Prof, we'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Nice to talk with you. And that was Professor John Stremlau of the Department of International Relations at Wits University joining us via Skype. We'll be back with more news at the top of the hour. Stay with us. <laughs>